the National Communication Authority, which is responsible for regulating broadcasting and telecommunication services in the country, has collaborated with the National Media Commission to establish the Broadcasting Monitoring Center. Every year on 17th May, to mark the formation of the United um, Nations ITU, which was established on 17th May 1865. The purpose of this celebration is to help raise awareness and of the possibilities of the use of the internet and ICTs to, and what they can bring to societies and economies as well as ways to break the digital divide. WTISD, as we call it, like its predecessors, focuses on a particular theme each year. For this year, the global theme is empowering the least developed countries through information and communication technologies. For us here in Ghana, however, we have settled on the theme, public-private partnership to improve connectivity. And our celebration today will happen in four distinct formats. The first is this opening session, where we'll have speeches from the NCA, from the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization, from the ITU Secretary General and the UN Secretary General. We will then briefly have a flag hoisting ceremony on the ground floor and then return here to the auditorium to listen to a presentation on the topic for discussion. That will be followed by a high powered panel discussion featuring the CEO of MTN, CEO of Main One, the CEO of GIFEC, and the Director for Technical Services at NITA. And we urge the media to kindly make sure that they, they are here for that session because it promises to be quite educative and very informational. May I have your attention to kindly just uh, introduce our guests who are here seated with us this morning. I'll start from my immediate right. We have Mr. Abdurrahmane Diallo, the country rep for UNESCO here in Ghana. Welcome, sir. Next to him is Honorable Amar Pomabwatin, MP for Jobin, and the Deputy Minister for Communications and Digitalization. Next is Mr. Isaac Emil Osebun, the board chairman of the NCA. Next to him is Professor Ize Osaye Bobatin, Deputy Director General for Technical Operations here at the NCA. Hello, Prof. From my far left, we have from main one, the CEO for main one, um, just one second, let me shuffle through this and then get the right name. The CEO for main one, um, Mr. Emmanuel Kwating. Welcome, sir. Then the CEO for GIFEC, Prince Sefa Fusu. Thank you, Prince. And then from um, MTN, Selma de Devo. I should be punished for forgetting the CEO of HLT Go's name, but I'm sure you forgive me for that. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Also with us are members of the NCA management as well as staff, and of course, executives and management from the various companies that are here presented, as well as, of course, the media who are here to support us in this celebration. Now, before I call on Mr. Professor Isa Oseyebo Bwatin to welcome us properly to this session, just a few house rules. First off, I kindly ask all of us to put our phones on silence or mute. If you are the type whose vibration is louder than a ringing tone, please make sure that you turn it off. Also, whilst here, if you need to use a washroom, we have smartly dressed ladies and gentlemen in black all around us. Kindly approach any of them, they will direct you to the washrooms as well. May I now kindly call upon our TO here, Professor Osebo Barton, to give us a welcome address. Good morning. The Honorable Deputy Minister for Communications and Digitalization, Madam Ama Poma Boatin, the Chief Director, Ministry of Communications and Digitalization, Mr. Alexander Yao Afo, the UN, the, sorry, the Country Rep for UNESCO, Mr. Abdul Rahman Diallo, the Chairman of Board of the NCA, Mr. Isaac Emil Osebonsu Jr., members of the board of NCA present, chief executives of mobile network operators here present, various consumer agencies, management and staff of NCA, our friends from the media, 
all other protocols observed. You are warmly welcome to the NCA to join us commemorate this year's World Telecommunications and Information Society Day, WTISD. Over the years, the NCA under the auspices of the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization has annually marked this year, which was set aside by the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, in 1969. The global focus for this year celebration is empowering the least developed countries through information and communication technologies. Least developed countries, LDCs, are described as low income countries confronted with severe structural obstructions to sustainable development. LDCs are countries with poor infrastructure and income inequality irrespective of its per capita gross domestic product. They are farthers behind in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, set by the United Nations to end extreme poverty, reduce inequality, and protect the planet. Since its adoption in 2015, Information and Communications Technology, ICT, has become an important tool which serves as a support structure for all the 17 SDGs. Currently, there are 46 countries in the world that have been declared by the United Nations as LDCs. Fortunately, Ghana is not on that list as LDC. Indeed, looking at Ghana's journey so far in ICTs, connectivity and digitalization, it is in the right direction that we support efforts to assist LDCs connect to the world. It was therefore in good faith that Ghana pledged its support during the ITU's launch of the Partner to Connect campaign, a project which seeks to accelerate universal and meaningful connectivity in the hardest to connect communities. However, in assisting LDCs, it is important that as a country we implement firm initiatives and collaborations to ensure sustainability. This cannot be done by the government alone. We believe that a public-private partnership is key to the attainment of this laudable goal. Ladies and gentlemen, it is in this regard that this year, Ghana has themed its celebration of WTISD as public-private partnership to improve connectivity. Public-private partnership, often referred to as PPP, involves the collaboration between a public or government entity and a private sector entity to provide infrastructure projects and initiatives for the use and benefit of the populace. As we all may be aware, the government of Ghana through the MOCD has over the years been pushing the digital agenda which aims, to, which aims at bridging the digital divide and improving digital literacy and access to connectivity. Projects such as the Rural Telephony, UMTS 900, Girls in ICT, Community Information Centers, National Roaming amongst others, have all been implemented by the ministry and its agencies and are steadily running and being monitored to improve connectivity. We cannot celebrate the successes chalked in these projects without the mention of our private sector constituents who have always supported these works. The aim is to bring everyone, including the marginalized and vulnerable groups who are often the least connected online. At the beginning of this year, there were over 22.8 million internet subscriptions in Ghana with a penetration rate of 71.94%. This signifies a major increase in connectivity as compared to previous years. We have made progress. However, there is still room for improvement as we seek and have pledged to empower LDCs to connect to the rest of the world. 
government cannot do this single-handedly, and this is the rationale behind the government's creation of an enabling environment for investment and for the private sector to thrive. It is also worthy to acknowledge that in 2020, to protect such investments and collaborations, the Parliament of Ghana passed the PPP Act 2020 at 10.39, inter alia to provide development through collaboration among public authorities and private parties for the provision of infrastructure and services. We are here today to discuss how best we can sustain partnership whilst bringing others on board to achieve an economy whose communication sector is digitally robust and securely connected. Emily Marashian, a philosopher and a poet, once said, and I quote, if you want to have enough to give to others, you will need to take care of yourself first. A tree that refuses water and sunlight for itself cannot bear fruit for others, unquote. As I bring my speech to a close, I take this opportunity on behalf of the NCA to call on all our constituents to continue to support government's policy directives. Please be assured that the regulator is committed to its mandate of regulating electronic communications activities and services in the country in a forward-looking and transparent manner that will encourage investment and protect stakeholders' interests. Once again, you're most welcome to the NCA Tower, and I wish us all very fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ize Oseyebo Boateng, for those welcome remarks. Now, the ITU General Secretary, Madame Doreen Bogdan Martin, has a message on this day, and that will be read to us by the board chair of the NCA, Mr. Isaac Emil Osebunsu Jr. Good morning. The Honorable Deputy Minister for Communications and Digitalization, Madam Ama Puma Boating, the Chief Director, Ministry of Communications and Digitalization, Mr. Alexander Afo, the Country Representative for UNESCO, Mr. Abdul Rahman Diallo, members of the NCA board who are present here this morning, Professor Isa Osei Yabuabwating, Deputy Director General Technical Operations of the NCA, the management and the staff of the NCA, Chief Executives of Mobile Network Operators, various consumer agencies, our friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, all other protocols observed. This morning, I bring you the message from the ITU Secretary General, Madam Doreen Bogdan Martin, on the World Telecommunication and Information Society Day. The message is actually themed empowering the least developed countries through the information and communication technologies. The Internet's first message and World Telecommunication and Information Society Day happened the same year, five decades ago. It changed the way that we think about the telecommunications and human connection. And today, digital technology is redefining what it means to to move and to connect to one another, to opportunity, to knowledge, and to the whole wide world. But on this day, we do remember that too many people are left behind. That's just one third. One third only of the population in the least developed countries, the LDCs, are hereby connected. 
that it is our collective responsibility to support LDCs on their journey from the potential to prosperity through technology. That is why ITU, the UN Agency for Digital Technologies, dedicates this day, this year, to all these countries. That's why I call on you today to join our campaign to empower LDCs by making a pledge to partner to connect digital coalition. Together, we can make 2023 a year of unprecedented digital development in the least developed countries and create a truly universally connected world where everyone, everywhere, shares in the benefits of technology. Thank you, and I wish you a good morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Isaac Emil Osebonsu, Jr., for bringing us uh, Madame Doreen Bogdan Martin's message. Now, let me, of course, welcome again uh, Leo Scalatus, the MD for ATL Tigo. I got the name right this time around. You're welcome. And again, just to tell you that the panel discussion we have in this, um, uh, after the session, we'll have um, four main um, um, reps on that panel, and they include um, the CEO for MTN, Salam Adedevo, the country manager for Main One Ghana, Emmanuel Kwarteng, the CEO for GIFEC, Prince of Ususefa, and the Director of Technical Services for NITA, Mr. Solomon Richardson. And they'll be speaking on the topic, um, how stakeholders can partner to bridge Ghana's connectivity gap. Again, for the flag hoisting ceremony that will take place after this session, Kali knew that it will be beamed here on the screen, so you don't have to all go downstairs. Just, just the, those on the high table and those required downstairs who would be there. The rest of us can watch this from here. It's actually nice to start from here because they will be in the sun whilst we are in the another conditioned room, so be here. Now, there's a message from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and I'd like to I'll kindly call upon the country rep for UNESCO, Mr. Abdurrahman Diello, to kindly bring that music to us. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Good morning, everybody. Honorable Deputy Minister, distinguished guests, all protocol respected. I'm very honored to be here on behalf of uh, the UN Resident Coordinator to share with you the message of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, on the occasion of uh, the World Telecommunication Information Society Day message. On this World Telecommunication Information Society Day, we highlight the power of technology to advance sustainable development in the least developed countries. The digital revolution is a defining force of our era. The opportunities are tremendous from transforming education and health care to accelerating climate action and the achievement of all the sustainable development goals. But to realize the promise of technology, we must confront its perils. The lack of ethical guardrails and robust governance frameworks, the proliferation of hate speech and disinformation, the amplification of social, social divides and economic inequalities, and the risk posed by artificial intelligence from deep fakes to biased decisions by neural networks that no human can fully explain. Technology must be an instrument to reduce divides, not deepen them. As the internet becomes ever more central to value creation and innovation, least development countries risk falling further behind. We must dramatically improve accessibility and inclusivity and eliminate the digital divide. 
we must support the creation of digital public goods, open source software, open data, and open content. We must invest in the capacities of public institutions so that they have the skills and the resources to understand, oversee, shape, and engage with artificial intelligence and other transformative technologies. And we must come together around a global digital compact to avoid fragmentation, safeguard human rights, and ensure technology is a force for human well-being, solidarity, and progress. I commend the International Telecommunication Union for working to accelerate global connectivity for all by 2030. Let's all do our part in closing the digital divide and securing a more equitable and sustainable future everywhere. End of uh, the message of uh, the Secretary General on this occasion. Just to close, uh, that one is uh, my words. I use uh, this opportunity, well, first to reiterate my pleasure to be here. Actually, it's the third time, I think, the third or fourth consecutive time. So uh, we are here, we are together on the journey. And I wish to take the opportunity really to congratulate the country, the leadership, the leadership of the specialized institution, the Ministry of Communication, Digitization, and all the agencies for the work they are doing. And uh, we, the UN here in Ghana, will be working with you. And of course, as it has been re uh, reminded, we cannot do it alone. The country cannot do it alone. The UN is just there to support, and we need all the private sector and all entities and all wheels to path together for the sustainable development. So thank you very much, and I wish you, all of us, a uh, happy International Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abiraman Diallo, for bringing us that message. Now, the presentation that we'll, be, we'll have before the panel will be on the topic, Public-Private Partnership to Improve Connectivity and Break the Digital Divide, and to be done by Mr. Kwame Bey Chamfo, the Head of International Affairs at MOCV, as well as Ghana's ITU Councillor, but that will be later on after the flag hoisting ceremony. And let me also just mention that the National Communications Authority is official organizer of WTISD in Ghana under the auspices of the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization. Now, to that ministry, I'll kindly call now up on the Deputy Minister for Communications and Digitalization and MP for Jobin, Honorable Ama Poma Boatin, to give us the keynote address. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to use the existing protocols to give the speech on behalf of the Honorable Minister, Mrs. Esla Usu Ekufo. Thank you for your attention. I'm delighted to join you in celebrating the World Telecommunication and Information Society Day. I bring greetings from the Honorable Minister who would have wished to be here with us, but due to exigencies of work, she asked me to represent her. The theme for this year's celebration, empowering the least developed countries through information and communications technologies is very apt. Ghana's adopted theme is public-private partnership to improve connectivity. Ghana being part of the least developed countries appreciates the challenges of our countries, appreciates the challenges our countries are facing to ensure the uptake and utilization of ICTs in our development agenda. The key challenges are availability of reliable ICT infrastructure, access devices, and digital skills. Ladies and gentlemen, globally, it is estimated by the United Nations and International Telecommunication Union that over 2.7 billion people in the world are unconnected. Government has made it a priority to invest in ICT infrastructure to ensure universal connectivity.
Ghana has extensive coverage of inland fiber through the efforts of government and the private sector to serve as a backbone for our broadband deployment. We also benefited from five international submarine cables at our shores to further bring connectivity to the doorstep of every citizen the ministry through the Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communication is implementing the Rural Telephony and Digital Inclusion Project dedicated at providing voice and data services to underserved and unserved communities in the country. From 2020 to 2022, 1,008 rural sites have been constructed for voice and data nationwide and many communities have already benefited and connected as we speak. We are optimistic that out of the 1,008 remaining sites to be completed, 560 rural sites will be completed by the end of this year. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, provision of connectivity has an accompaniment of usage we must not lose sight of the fact that we need to close the technology usage gap. There is the need for more investments to ensure that everyone has access to information communication technology tools. Citizens must have access devices to be able to interact meaningfully and also transact public and private services online without any barriers. Today, a large percentage of Ghanaians transact businesses online and pay for services using mobile money account. Online meetings and schooling are now accepted in every part of the world. This acceptability was enforced during the COVID-19 pandemic, which drove us to the limit and made it clear just how important ICT and digital platforms are. However, while connectivity has brought many benefits, it has also created new challenges, including privacy issues, cyber-related fraud, and digital illiteracy. Therefore, it is crucial to ensure that connectivity is not only universal and meaningful, but also safe for everyone, so that people are empowered to fully participate in the digital economy and society. This also means that there is a need for a reliable and secure SIM registration database. I wish to urge the NCA to continue monitoring the SIM registration exercise and ensure that we have a sanitized SIM database. Government has established a national roaming policy to address some of the challenges of network coverage and their impact on telephone consumers. It is a step towards ensuring that all citizens, regardless of their location, have access to reliable telecommunication services. We established a cyber labs program, which focuses on establishing cyber labs across the country to enhance digital literacy and skills development. Since its inception in 2017, we have established a total of 1,260 cyber labs nationwide. The ministry is also developing the digital economy policy, and one of the priority pillars is digital skills to give policy focus and interventions to address that challenge. The ministry has prioritized the girls in ICT program, and I must use this opportunity to thank MTN and uh, other stakeholders for supporting the ministry in this. And we are committed to upscaling girls on rotational basis nationwide on the use of computers. Since 2017, about 10,800 girls and 700 teachers have been trained in basic ICT skills and coding. The ministry's flagship projects, digital communities and the girls in ICT programs, aim to whip up the interests of people in ICT-related programs 
from an early age and direct them towards careers in the ICT field. The government has committed $2.6 million to innovation centers and is training 3,000 people by 2024. The ministry also has an agreement with the Smart Africa Alliance through the Smart Africa Digital Academy to train up to 22,000 people by 2023. Also, the Universal Access Fund Administration operates over 220 community ICT centers across rural communities that are used for capacity building skills training and business advisory services. The government is not relenting on its promise to ensure that no one is left behind. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to encourage the private sector pl players to join government in heeding the ITU's call for pledges for universal connectivity and digital transformation through its partner to connect digital coalition with a focus aligned with the theme of this year's celebration. I wish to thank all stakeholders, such as the civil service organization, development partners, industry players, particularly in the private sector, and community leaders who have led advocacy, mobilization, and engagement efforts towards promoting digital inclusion. We have all done a lot, but there is still more to do. Together, let's deepen our partnerships towards achieving universal access to digital technologies. Let us progress together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Ama Poma Boatin, MP for Jobin and Deputy Minister for Communications and Dexalization. Now, would this is how we're going to have the flag hoisting ceremony downstairs. It will be done by the Honorable Deputy Minister for Communications, supported by the Country Manager for UNESCO, as well as the Deputy Director General for Technical Operations at the NCA, Professor Isosia Yeboabuatin. You have to be joined downstairs by the uh, panel members, uh, the CEO of MTN, GIFFEC, Main One, as well as uh, Etelteco CEO, um, and management staff downstairs for the flag hoisting ceremony. While that is going on, the rest of us can see it on the screens here. And soon after that, we'll have a, a, a coffee break. This will be the outline for the coffee break. Agency directors and uh, operators, as well as uh, our speakers, will go to the fifth floor for the coffee break, while the rest of us will go to the adjoining room to the auditorium for our coffee break. That will not take long because we want to come back here quickly for us to have the presentation and the panel before we close out of here. So uh, the media. You don't, your session doesn't end with this opening session. Yeah, please encourage you to stay here for that session. I mean, if I, if I had the CEO of uh, Main One, MTN, and GIFEC, as well as Nita, having a chat on their role in bridging the digital divide, I would like to listen to them and then see what, what takeaways I can have for my news bulletin. So we encourage you to kindly join us for that session. So for now, however, may we please, uh, um, uh, Ashes, please lead our guests downstairs for the flag question ceremony. And technical team, let's have that beam on the screens here so that the rest of us here can be catching what is going on downstairs on the screens. Management staff of NCA, please join them downstairs as well. Thank you very much.
room to this auditorium please the request of the agency's fifth floor thank you very much How long will it take? Yeah, big. I want to know. We will try to undertake and get a meeting. Why? Mm. Otherwise, we look because we want to meet to stay here until we saw. We don't want to drag anything to you. And the tattoo will be great. Thank you. And the panel discussion took like one hour. One hour forty-five. One hour forty-five. One hour, no, one hour forty-five. Ah, uh, between forty-five and one hour. Uh -huh.
Under the auspices of the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization, the National Communication Authority, which is responsible for regulating broadcasting and telecommunication services in the country, has collaborated with the National Media Commission to establish the Broadcasting Monitoring Center. The NCA established the Broadcasting Monitoring Center to provide the required technical support for the objectives of the Memorandum of Cooperation. This new Broadcasting Monitoring Center provides continuous 24-7 monitoring of FM radio broadcasting services as well as television broadcasting services. There are two types of monitoring. One is the monitoring of the technical conditions of broadcasting authorizations and the other is the monitoring of the content by way of recording the content of each broadcasting station. The system provides content recording of 100 TV stations and 50 FM stations to support the cooperative agreement with the National Media Commission. The system also provides video evidence for law enforcement agencies and other government organizations upon request. For the FM stations, what we look out for is the compliance of all FM stations to their FM authorization. The system allows us to see if any station is violating and it records the logs of these errors. We currently work with the National Media Commission to select the stations that must be recorded and we are able to retrieve these recordings at any time that we need them. What NCA has established for all of us is going to permit us at the National Media Commission to see the trends in media coverage and their implications for peace building and national development. We have the 120 meter dishes, the 100 meter dishes. There's a little rack down there, and then the signals are all converted to fiber and then sent into the data center. It is systems like this that enable us to share the impact of the media with all of us, so it serves as a mirror to reflect society back to us in a lot of very useful ways. For satellite television, we are monitoring the technical parameters across the country. For terrestrial television, we are monitoring technical conditions for the greater Accra region. Uh, we have smaller centers like this in the regional offices for the services in those regions. For FM radio broadcasting, we are monitoring the compliance to the technical conditions within the greater Accra region. The expansion and upgrade of the NCA broadcasting monitoring system to this state-of-the-art installation could not have come at a more opportune time as it is happening after Ghana was voted onto the ITU's radio regulations board. It may be interesting to note, just when this centre was set up, we had a visit from our sister regulator in Nigeria that is seeking to establish something similar to help them, especially with the content monitoring ahead of the crucial elections that are expected to come off next year. This would really keep a lot of media houses, in fact all media houses on their toes. Just the awareness that someone is watching in itself is some sort of regulation in itself because people are conscious of who is watching them. We only want to wish the NCA team the greatest success. We're excited about your sense of efficiency and innovation. And let us be able to say within the next couple of years that learning from the outcome of the monitoring processes, we have together improved our work as media. It is our hope that we can engage further with your institutions to maximize the benefits of this important national installation in the national interest and for the public good. Ghana's Telecommunications Regulator, the National Communications Authority, NCA, inaugurated the Type Approval and Conformance Laboratory in July 2018. It consists of four main labs. These are the Specific Absorption Rate Lab, the Radio Frequency and Signaling, otherwise known as the RF Lab, the Electromagnetic Field Strength, or EMF Lab, and the Digital Terrestrial Television, or DTT Lab. 
Hello, you are welcome to the Specific Absorption Rate Lab. My name is Peter Onyekwe of the National Communications Authority. The object of this lab is to measure the amount of radiation our body absorbs when using a wireless electronic communication equipment, just to ensure the safety of the users. The lab is set up in line with the IEC 6006220. Dash one, 2011 standard. Our lab is set up in two fold. We have the control area and the measurement environment. Let's take a look of the lab for us to appreciate ourselves with the specification and the equipment in the lab. This is the control area of the SAR lab. In the control area, we have our power amplifier. We have our signal generator. We have the network emulator. This is our system unit, which houses the software, which is open source software, which we use for the analysis of our results. This is a vector network analyzer. We have the sample of the tissues to be measured. We have a sample of the distilled water. For a full measurement at the lab, there is a need to go through three main processes before the device is measured. We have the liquid validation, we have the uh, dipole validation, and we have noise evaluation. All these three steps mix up what you call the system validation. The essence of this system validation is to make sure that whichever result the system is going to give us is actually appropriate. For the liquid validation, this is done to ascertain the dielectric properties of the tissue. The tissue used at the lab depicts the property of the human skin, depending on the frequency of end technology to be measured. So, for the liquid validation, you will need a sample of the tissue of the frequency to be measured, and you need a sample of a distilled water. With these two samples, a validation is done using the vector network analyzer with a probe. So this is done to ensure that the dielectric property of this tissue to be used for measurement is within recommended standard according to IEC 62209-1-2011. For the dipole validation, the system required for the dipole validation includes the dipole of the frequency to be measured, the signal generator, the power amplifier. This is done by generating a continuous wave from the signal generator which is amplified to achieve at least 20 dB which is inserted into the dipole of the frequency to be measured. For this dipole, this is the dipole for frequency 1900 megahertz. So with this, we'll be doing a measurement of a dipole validation for 1900 megahertz. For noise evaluation the noise evaluation is done to ensure that the noise within the measurement environment is less than 12 milliwatts per kilogram the essence of this is also to control the presence of noise in the measurement environment in this instance the noise is the presence of another frequency apart from the frequency of to be measured in the measurement environment, we'll take a look of the equipment um, specification in the measurement area. In our measurement area, we have gallons of our tissue. This is a tissue we use for the measurements. This tissue depicts the property of the human skin for the particular frequency to be measured. And this is our shielded chamber. The essence of this chamber is to cut out uh, the RF noise to ensure that the only RF within the chamber is the RF to be of the frequency to be measured. And in this chamber, we have 
our robot controller, and my colleague, Romeo Tofik, will take us through the other devices in the chamber. Okay, so you are welcome to the testing area of the SAR lab. Now, it is a shielded area because when the, uh, the, the test is ongoing, we try to avoid any form of interference, be it RF, radio frequency noise. So it's a shielded area for that particular purpose. The setup in the lab we have is the bench. Now, on both sides, we have uh, phantoms. This is a phantom that is shaped in the form of a human head. The second phantom is a flat phantom, which also helps us to measure devices such as the laptops and then uh, tablets. Now, this is a robot that is used keyly for the purposes of measurement. Attached to the robot is what we call the probe. Now this probe uh, is dipped into what we call the tissue here. The tissue is a liquid that possesses uh, <clears throat> qualities or properties of the human skin. So the test basically portrays the human head with the skin and then beneath the probe, uh, beneath the phantom, we have are two holders. The first of its kind is the dipole holder. As indicated earlier, the dipole is used for validation purposes. Second is the DUT holder, which is the device under test. Now, attached to it is the mobile phone, which as you can see is connected to the ear of the human head. This is a typical test in processor. That also indicates how measurement is done. So the probe is able to measure the emissions or radiations from the DUT. Next to the setup we have is the multimeter. This also helps us to measure multiple measurement states to have in a common unit. Now attached to the upper part of the desk we have is the virtual positioning system. This system is, a, is this the point where the probe as connected to the robot picks its reference point before the measurement begins. Lastly on our setup we have is the antenna. This antenna is connected to the base station and then it is the point which we enable the transmit and reception of signals for the purposes of the testing because the device under test is actually in motion. It is a call that is ongoing to enable us measure and take the accurate reading of emissions from the device that is being tested. It is worth noting that the lab is set up in line with IEC 62209-1-2011 standard. This is a standard that guides the setup and running of the SALA. So all the specification of the equipment, the processes is specified in this standard. So in this standard, it is identified or stated the properties of the tissue to be used depending on the frequency. It is also stated the property of the phantom and the device holder to ensure that radiations are absorbed in line with the behavior of the human body. As well, in line with this standard, we have limits for radiation. For us in Ghana, our adopted limit is the ICNEF limit, which is 2 watts per kilogram per 10 gram. What this means is that for every 10 gram of our tissue, you are expected not to absorb more than 2 watts per kilogram. And it is also worth noting that this system of ours is capable of measuring with reference to ICNEF standard or FCC standard, which is 1.6 watts per kilogram for 1 gram. So, irrespective of the standard of the adopted country, this, our facility, is capable of measuring with reference to this standard. So, the setup and operation of the Star Lab is strictly in line with IEC 62209-1-2011 standard, which keep revolving and seeing amendments depending on the changes that goes on. So, in, in, in summary, the SAR lab system is set up in such a way that it measures the radiations or the emission the body absorbs when using a wireless electronic communication equipment just to ensure safety of the user. The next step is to generate and analyze the report with the help of 
our software, OpenSA system, which is a proprietary software. And on our screen, it's a typical example of a generated report. And the report is in two parts. The first part is the introduction and a description of uh, the, the certainties and uh, the measurement procedure in line with the IEC 62209-1, 2011. And this described the measurement procedure, the description of the interpolation and extrapolation scheme that was used for the analysis of the testing that was performed, uh, the uncertainty of all the equipment that was used, because all this uh, was considered in the analysis and the calculation that was done by the system. And the next part focuses on the results of all the measurements that was done. So for proper review of a SAR test report, we need to look out for the result for the liquid validation, system validation, and the dipole validation, and the noise validation. All this will contribute to the final result that would have been would have been achieved because if after the system validation the drift is too much or above the recommended standard there is high possibility that the final result of the testing of the DUT would not be correct so you look out for the system validation you look out for the value of uh, the noise validation that was uh, 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 achieved you look out for the dipole validation that was achieved, as well as the liquid validation that dielectric properties that was achieved to make sure it's within the recommended standard before the DUT result. So on, on our screen, you have the specific absorption rates result for both the 1 gram and 10 gram. As I mentioned earlier, this system is capable of measuring for with reference to ICNEP standard or the FCC standard. So for one gram, you could see from our table, which is the result of what was measured, from our table you could see that the maximum SAR for, for 900 GSM of this measurement that was done, on the right side of the head, at the right tilt position of the device, in line with the standard again, and the channel of frequency that was measured is 975. And the frequency is 880.2. The maximum SAR value for one gram is 0 0.06. And the maximum SAR value for 10 gram is 0 0.05. With the power drift of negative 3.51. And the total scan that was performed on that position is 6. So with this value, it is clear that this device actually had an output which is far below the recommended standard. Because for one gram, we said the limit is 1.6 watts per kilogram for one gram. And we are measuring 0.06 watts per kilogram for one gram. And that of the 10 gram, which is 2 watts per kilogram for, one, for 10 gram. The public-private partnerships to improve connectivity and bridge digital divide. And our presenter will be Mr. Kwame Bechanfo, Head International Affairs at the Ministry of Communications, as well as Ghana's ITU counselor. Kwame, please. Thank you, Kwame. I'm not as tall as you, so let me adjust. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We celebrate Telecommunication and Information Society today globally across the 198 countries who subscribe to the United International Telecommunications Union, which tends to be the biggest UN subscription uh, by far. This morning, I will be brief. We will just have a little view on the, on the theme and the opportunities that are available to us as Ghana. PPP for connectivity and digital divide. For the media, this is not a party manifesto. 
uh, know where I'm coming from. It is public-private partnership. But because of the L and the R, that is why I'm calling it PPP, so that I don't move on any slippery slope. You see, I've tried. So then we will go into the Ghana's connectivity journey, and we will have some ongoing connectivity programs in Ghana, some policy recommendations, as well as partnership opportunities. Today, the theme is empowering the least developed countries through information and communications technologies. What a country we have. Our country is in gray. The countries in blue, about 33 of them in Africa, are least developed countries. Only Haiti in America is a least developed country. And then we have the others in Asia. So when we are making comparisons, we should not be comparing ourselves to African countries, indeed, as a country, because we are not among the least developed countries who the ITU today is especially looking at how they are empowered. But how do we take advantage of this, even though we are not a least developed country? Look at the NCA by day and by night. They have 11 strong players, like the Blaster team. And these are their two kits, which they use. You can go through the list because of time as you view it. But this is to show how, as a country, we are endowed in our enabling environment. And if we have neighboring countries who are least developed countries, what can we do with such endowment? The opportunities for us empowering these least developed countries is extending our international broadband connectivity to them. I heard Deputy Minister mention we have five, but I think there's about the six on the way, if not already here. And if you look at our least developed countries, we have Ivory Coast on our side, and we have Nigeria on our side, who could be our competitors extending international bandwidth. But we have Lome, we have Ogadugu by proximity. Data hosting services. We have tier four data centers in our country. We have international cables. And so it goes together. How do we sell these capacities out of our country? We are creating hubs, and how do we co-create solutions to our needs and contents to our needs? The media in Ghana has made us know that it is not about abroad for some. You can do local, local, and you will still be the leader in the market. In the media space, our local radio and TV stations are doing so well, how come in the telecommunications space we are consuming foreign content rather than our localized application services and content? So PPP, what is in there? The public bringing something, private sector bringing something, and each of them taking away. Sometimes what we bring, or what each, each party bring, may not be financial, and what each party may take away may not be financial. Sometimes human resources, sometimes for social good, and all that. How do we improve connectivity and bridge digital divide in our country? That's a question. There will be the discussions to go. But let's talk about some of the good things. As a country, today is for celebration. As a country, sometimes we don't celebrate what we have, but we focus on what, if you could have celebrated what we have, you could have gotten. One of the things that we have to celebrate in this country is the number of submarine cables landing in this country. Some time ago, 
for you to have two megabits per second speed in this country, that was over ten thousand dollars a month. Twenty-one thousand. Yes, that was when you were in the industry. Because he was ahead of me, and it was twenty-one. When I joined, it was then reducing. So we. <laughs> So it tells you, but now we get two megabits per second for Persuas. That is the difference. And it is all because of this international submarine cables. We had Ghana Telecom owning Star 3, a monopoly. And if you go to the National Telecom Policy 2005, it tells you how government, who owns that cable, gives out that that cable whole significant market power and that it has to be regulated by prices. So the media, the first time you may be hearing SMP is 2010, but that's not correct. Government documented as far back as 2005 how its own property, which it makes money from, should be regulated by prices determining how much is sold on um, internet to Ghanaians. So when we had that difficulty in the country, then a Nigerian lady came and said, I want to give you a cable, May 1. As a is here, within about three weeks or so, we put together to draft a license. And in fact, we were even hesitant to, to take a, a licensing fee or application fee because it was a dream come true that somebody else was bringing a fiber cable and it will solve your capacity and price issues. Then another followed, which should be Glow. So you may not understand how come Glow won over Wahi Telecom, which was 100% equity. They had so much money. But Glow was coming with the fiber cable. We gave them the license not because we wanted them to sponsor Ghanaian League two years before they started operations, but it was because we needed that cable so badly. And then we had WAX and we had um, ACE, yes, following up between that uh, space of time, getting us to five, and then now we have uh, two Africa to follow if they have not already landed. So. When you talk about international connectivity, we've had the situation of satellite farms and all that, but I will explain later on as we go through. This. But this is one to celebrate. Our fiber across the country, that is a difficult one. That is a certain gap. Usually the focus is around what they call the golden triangle, Kumase, Accra, Takrade. Now you see the eastern going to Elubu, and I know some work is going up west and north. The eastern fiber to the north through Volta and all that. And all these, is this the ultimate? I will leave that for the panel discussion as they even also talk about metro fiber. I will let us to go down into history that I don't know how many of us were born in 1992 here, but <laughs> those times, if you needed to talk to someone abroad, you actually record the message on a cassette and post at the post office. And then the person will respond to your message by also recording on a cassette to bring it back to you. You could go to the post office and queue, and you'll be told the time where your call will come in. So when we had Mijina Bontena make us say, Mobitel, they coming in, they were lying things, and one thing with our, our market is that it's synonymous with our democracy. So in 1990, just as we were looking at a referendum and new constitution, so we had the first authorization to operate a mobile telephony, Mijina Bontain, Namika said, Mobita, okay. 900 rich people went, went for that service. It was not for 
everybody who you meet in the corner and is pressing your phone. These were specialized people, you know. Some of them, when they were working around, their phones were in a certain basket that somebody is holding. Because the Mijina Bontina maker say it's like a whole chop box that you are taking to Atibota School. Okay, so you can see the trend as to the growth of doubling up almost every year. This is the 90s, doubling up almost every year to 2000. But it was not the work of only Mobitel. Two years after it started operations, we also had Celtel. And they were very much in Accra. So they brought in a certain focus, a certain capacity, and they helped that doubling up by the year. What is interesting, and again, when we are talking about our guards and going forward from all this, please don't take it so much hard. But for us to take lessons, when M Mobitel came in, they took the entire 900 megahertz frequency. Okay, so then we had these guys, space phone. When space phone was coming in, now the regulator had to go to the operator to ask for the frequency to give some to space phone. Because it could be that the regulator did not know at that time what that frequency could be used for. But because they were coming in with the technological knowledge, they knew what the future was. So we had space phone coming in. And then we eventually, the government realized that now the three private people, they are liberalized enough, they were overtaking the number of fixed that Ghana Telecom had. And now government too wanted to chop small and brought one touch. Now let's move forward. So there's this man, the Major J.R.K. Tando a former director general of the NCA. Indeed, this building is on a land that he acquired when he was a board member at the Civil Aviation Authority and also the DG, with the vision that one day, NCA will not be living in some two-bedroom um, offices, account to men's where it started from, but to be in a city. This visionary, in 20, 2002, seeing the previous trend, and he was a radio regulations board member at the ITU. And this is what he sought from the ITU. Because in those times, the UNDP would give their money to ITU to do connectivity projects. And these are his words. His, uh, you, you may want to say, to bridge the digital divide, in particular, providing broadband internet access. So about 21 years ago, there was the talk about bridging the digital divide and broadband internet access. How far are we? Now we go into the 2000s, and many things changed at this phase. In 2004, you could see that between 2004, we had the first Tau a million, and we celebrated that in this country. Because at that, at that moment, because of GPRS technology on the phone, you could use your phone to access internet. If not, you need your father's home phone to do a dial-up. And for you to open the Yahoo page, you can go to market and come back. <laughs> and the page will still be doing that for you. In those times, the email addresses were either Yahoo or Hotmail. So when you see somebody who has a Hotmail email address, respect the person. <laughs> so when we had that, then there was also the space to space. Space to space also gave the opportunity for people 
to move beyond Ghana Telecom Communication Centers, but to have mobile telephony on boxes or kiosks, little kiosks across the country. So there were certain economic, social, political, and technological factors which is letting us see this growth. And we have to take that um, forward in our thinking when we are looking at addressing the gaps. Fortunately, we had the national telecom policy, and I've already talked about how it, it addressed the SMP word SAT3. But let's look at the vision of this telecom policy in 2005. This was where we were, about 3 million. The telecom policy was telling us that it expects penetration of the country to be at 25% by 2010. 25%. And for rural places, 10%. That was how ambitious the policy was. This is because the policy was being advised by the being under 1% and so was very considerate. What happened? In two years, that target was made redundant. But it was because this telecom policy, again, in this wisdom, was saying that if a telecom operator or a mobile service pro provider is able to provide connectivity in all regional capitals, it should count for international gateway license. Because at that time, you see that the number of subscriptions on the mobile were more. So why would your traffic, why should your traffic go through Ghana Telecom for them to have a bit of it before they give it to you? Because when we receive international calls, we re that is receiving money. So now the mobile operators became better motivated to expand, to take their own money away from Ghana Telecom. So you saw the incentive in 2008. So where were we? 11 million. And what did we hear? Some two ministers went on demonstration. I won't mention their names. <laughs> they said that the growth will retire. Um, prices will go up. People will stop using everything. But it was the reverse. We saw the growth. Okay. In 2010, there was the broadband wireless access. When we saw that the voice subscription had gone up, we were looking for operators who would focus on giving data services. And so we had Selfline Blue, Goki, who never took off. There was BBH, who was already in motion. Blue decided to settle at one corner, as a Kumono, and then Selfline could do everything that they could, but it was just a bit of a crowd, of which we hear last week, they've shut their network down unfortunately. But the entire strategy is that we were not asking them to do voice because we wanted them to focus on data. 2011, we had number portability. And the whole idea is that you are not happy with one service provider, then you move to the another. Now, the people that the others were looking at, they are going to steal their subscribers, ended up they're losing their subscribers to them. And you know what I mean. <laughs> then we had our first attempt at SIM registration in 2012. So that was where we were, 25,000. And then 2014, nothing actually happened. But by then, we had had the, the cables coming. By 2012, 2014, we've had the cables coming. Okay, just to look at certain critical areas of our growth, petitioning them, 
this is where the trouble started. So in 2015, we had six of them, BBH working. Then 2016, we gave the 800 megahertz band. And our lives has never been the same. So, in green is what we were measuring as broadband wireless, which was specially for the self lines blue and. But in two, from 2016 onwards, we had MTN joining. So, you see the following year what happened. 400,000 more. We had three of them doing 100,000, one person or one entity joins in 400. The next year, 1.1. That is impactful. I wish we could celebrate that, but people will say the regulator is being biased. Now, We get to this part, our now. Looking at the way things were going, and even before MTN got into what people call the 4G space, SMP was for real. So in 2020, MTN was declared the SMP. In this chart, you will see that till date, voice subscription is going down. Those are the 40 million, and we're getting to 38 million. You could also attribute it to SIM registration. And if NCA should fulfill their promise of disconnecting, 11 million people in the Stubborn Academy. And if you deduct that, then we are getting somewhere in the 20 millions. But we hope that those 11 million exist. What is also getting down is the one we call data. And these are 2G two, two, two and 3G. They are on 2 and 3G technologies. Rather, what is going up is in green the broadband wireless access, and that is good news. That means now connectivity, as Major Tando was seeking, broadband access, now we are increasing on that. Whereas we are reducing on what people will call not the meaningful connectivity, and that's on the 2G and the 3G. What is also good news is what is in yellow, the mobile wallets. I had a report to Bank of Ghana. I didn't use the number of persons who are registered. I used the number who are active, people who send money on Mother's Day. So you could see that the number keeps increasing. And that is also good news because there is no bank, and all the banks in this country, they do not have this number of subscribers. Not even the voter registration, which votes for the president of the country has 20 million subscribers. So it tells you how good our connectivity has been to date, that our unmeaningful connectivity is reducing. We are gaining broadband wireless access and also financial inclusion is on the rise. Now let's look at what as government has been doing and probably has not been celebrated. Every secondary school in this country, college of education, tertiary institution, fully loaded, ultra-modern. They have the labs, they, are, they have the Wi-Fi connectivity, the schools don't pay, government do that. 
GFX CEO will talk about the implementation of the 216 rural sites. It's bigger than one operator in this country. And other initiatives when it comes to connectivity. Then there is the national and ECOWAS roaming. In this country, especially for GFEC, on the idea of GFEC is building the network, it doesn't matter your operator. You go to that location, you can still make calls, browse, send money. Very good. You remember in ECOWAS, most of the countries are least developed. The one who is not least developed, like Ivory Coast, you have agreed to us. We, are, we go to Ivory Coast, you call at the same rate like you are calling in, in Ghana. Would you also come the same, no problem. Connectivity, you don't need to buy another SIM card there. That's what we are trying to eliminate. After all, there are one side which is in Zima, French, and in Zima, English. Then, what is to come? Police stations, where they arrest people and put in jail. They are going to have free Wi-Fi, 275 of them, 193 post offices, health centers. Even if you are sick, you can go there, browse, and you'll be well. Then, Deputy Minister talked about digital skills, and this is where government is investing most, and I know private sector is support. Now, I come from the, the last one, the girls, and we have the cooperation of ATC, MTN, uh, GIFEC, and many other entities who are supporting the girls in ICT uh, program. Children, whether they are boys or girls, GIFEC has a program for them. I will leave the CEO to, to, to take us through that. Ghana has the agreement with Smart Africa where youthful population entrepreneurs, now women who uh, comb hairs and dress hairs and sew things, they have their Instagrams that they are able to know how to use it to market their products and services. And we are currently on a program that in this year, we have a deal with Amazon Web Services, where we are training 10,000 Ghanaians to be ready for anything IT, junior developer, solution architect, 10,000. Um, and then, of course, our regulators and our policy makers also need to be educated. But to move forward to our digital economy policy recommendations, which is to come, what is important is that remember, the first pillar is universal access and connectivity. And that is how we are seeking, how do we collaborate on that? One thing for sure, which is beyond us, is electricity. Indeed, what our operators have done well is that they rather provide power to the communities where they deploy their networks, that where their tower is or their site is, the people then bring their phones from home to come and charge their phones there because there's no electricity in that particular area. And so we need the ECG who has been disconnecting us these days to rather focus on ra chasing the electricity provision in those areas to help our agenda of giving connectivity everywhere. Again, national backbone, we saw the gaps in the fiber and all that. Then, what is our broadband? The 3G license mentions 2 megabit per second. Is that where we want to stay? So, it is in, it's a policy recommendation that we consider what speed we want to be at. One more important thing is affordability of devices. And I know one operator again they will send you a message that now come and bring deposits and pay over certain months or week and you have a device. So this policy, even though it's yet to be in effect, some of you have started and we very much appreciate that. We want to assemble and even produce our own devices in this country for various reasons. Youth employment, security and all that but who are the partners to let us accomplish this during COVID, you the operators did well zero rated websites and all that i don't know whether it still exists but we are not asking for zero rated for netflix we are asking for education health and agriculture connectivity 
So if you can find in your CSRs to address this for us, it is the policy recommendation. Then to this house, transition to technology neutral. Indeed, some of the bands which are currently in use could be used for 4G, 5G, and all that. How soon are we going to have that transition? So to look at the opportunities for partnership, migration from 3G to 4G, the reason is that 3G was an improvised technology. It was not really meant for data um, speeds. 4G is the ultimate. How do we make better utilization of the 200 megahertz for it to be used for 4G? Face broadband to homes and offices is also quite low. Fiber to homes is a challenge. Now we hear satellites to homes on their way. Who are the partners to help us get there? Promotion of our locally developed applications, services to become unicorns. Indeed, we are ready to accept all manner of applications from other countries. But for those that are developed in our country, how well do we promote them? When you go to Korea, even though you have the foreign ones, but the first that you could associate with is one which is in Korea. And probably as partners, we can do better to have unicorns. Then locally manufactured and assembled and development of digital competencies. If you give us all computers and we don't know how to open it, there will be no connectivity. So the competencies are also very important. So I'll end here and say let us be all partners bridging the digital divide. Thank you very much. That's Kwame Bechamfo, um, the head of international affairs at the Ministry of uh, Communications. But of course, Kwame, until then, actually he's a second from the NCA. Let's, let's mention that. He still the staff of the NCA, <laughs> borrowed by the Ministry of Communications and Utilization. We are that kind to the ministry. Now we are at the point where we'll have a, a panel discussion. The moderator is a professor from academia, of course. Tell us how serious we take these conversations. Professor Ize Osebo Abuatin will be leading that panel, which has um, uh, from MTN, Selma Devo, who is the CEO there. From Main One Ghana, Emmanuel Kwati, the country manager. From Nita, uh, Solomon Richardson is the director for technical services. And from the Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communications, Prince of Utusefa, the CEO there, who of course started off uh, by being here at the NCA as well. So it's the NCA produces and then we then lend them off to other agencies that need our services. So uh, uh, Prince, yes, so, yes, so you, you have it in the back of your mind. We lent you to, to, to give fake. Same as Kwame as well. So uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, just for information. So, Prof, please take your seats, honorable panel members. Um, I believe you are ready now for you as well. Yes, I'm sure you'll be here. Salam, please. Emmanuel, Prince. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, your panel. Prof, please. All right. Good. Still morning. Good morning. Okay. So, I'm privileged uh, to be here with the CEOs and the director uh, to take the discussion of digital divide. Um, typically, when you talk about the digital divide, maybe looking at the negative aspect of it, but we would want to look at it from positive perspective of digital inclusion. You know, that's when you flip it the other way around. Now, traditionally, when you talk about digital divide, we're looking at access, we're looking at time, 
to create these assets, and then also the speed. So uh, the question, and all of you could take it as uh, your preambles. So what are you in your particular uh, organization doing to bridge this divide? I know a lot has been said. Um, we're looking at also to help the LDCs. So Ghana, we may not be having uh, access for everyone. At least there's some access thanks to GIFEC and the work they're doing. But still, there is some form of uh, uh, digital divide in terms of access, in terms of the time to deliver, in terms of the speed. So I'd like you to look at it from any of these perspectives, how your organization is trying to address this. We'll take it from my left, um, Emmanuel. Thank you, Isa. Okay, so um, good morning to all. Uh, from our side, I mean, in terms of how we are, we are looking at it, uh, two, two, two points. I mean, we're looking at it from an angle of the digital infrastructure itself. So we realize that for, for us to bridge the gap, uh, we need to put in place infrastructure that enables people, I mean, invest, people who are going to invest in Ghana and who want to do business to do, move to the market quickly. And uh, so recently we have started, in fact, we started in 2015, but we're doing more in that in West Africa where we are building data centers where what you need to do is just bring your equipment and then you start, uh, um, immediately you can start uh, operating. Uh, also, when you look at the least developed um, countries, especially the landlord countries that we have, what we are doing is that we are um, partnering with some of the uh, part our partners in Ghana and extending connectivity to those areas. Because we've had a lot of those discussions with the likes of ISOC and things like that over the years, uh, where we realized that there were always challenges in the likes of Niger, Burkina, and things like that. We went there, we had discussions with them, with the governments as well, and we figured that what, what we could do as, uh, as, a, as a submarine provider at the time uh, was that, because we have huge capacity at the, at the shore, and so we needed to bring it in, in house. And then to be able to do that, we needed to partner those who can carry us to the borders. And I mean, good, we've done that. We are bringing huge capacities now uh, into those uh, landlocked countries. Good, so uh, Salom. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and morning. Um, great to be here. So on the MTN side, I mean, there are a lot of things we're, we're doing, but, but let me start off with, you know, maybe a characterization of how we think about connectivity and bridging the digital gap and, and what our role as an operator really is. I mean, for us, we look at three main dimensions. Um, you know, the first one you can think of as connectivity. The second one is your entire end-to-end -end digital experience. And then the third bucket is your financial experience or financial inclusion. Today, I'll touch more on the connectivity part, but you know, happy to share more thoughts on all the different verticals. On the connectivity part, I mean, you would have heard our strategic intent is to lead solutions, digital solutions for Africa's progress. And in doing that, there are a number of different frameworks that we use to achieve that. The first one is Chase where C means coverage. Under coverage, we talk about basic connectivity around fiber connectivity, but also mobile connectivity. And today, we're thinking also about home connectivity. How do you bring home broadband to people at home beyond just the mobile connectivity? Because we see, since COVID, a massive shift towards home dependency when you're thinking about how to be productive for work an SME trying to enhance their business. These are all dependencies that people have, and these are all areas that we look at. Of course, as part of the connectivity framework, you're looking at two main things, inland fiber connectivity, as well as undersea cable connectivity. These are all areas that we're looking to continue to drive growth in. And you would have seen recently, and it was great to see on um, my good friend Kwame's presentation that Two Africa is actually in there because um, our partner company, Global Connect, is actually pushing that. We see the growth on connectivity to be significant. Today, a lot of people will talk about data pricing and all of that, but a large part of the reason we can't be as competitive as other markets is a lack of basic connectivity infrastructure. So for us, the C in Chase is a massive C. I mean, it's 
you know, probably the most fundamental element of how we can bridge the digital divide. Of course, in that C for coverage is also rural coverage. And you would know that MTN partnered you know, with Huawei to develop the Rural Star Solution in collaboration with the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization. And we came up with a solution that reduced the cost to deploy to rural areas by approximately 40 to 60%, depending on whether it was OPEX or CAPEX. And all of this is geared towards allowing access and getting to some of the rural areas and the communities that we are. Of course, today we're looking at the partnership with my good friend on my left um, on on the GIFX side with the 2016 site. So we're part of that program as well, I hope. And, um, <laughs> and we're continuing to partner government in a PPP um, to enable rural connectivity for that. Chase, H in Chase is really for handsets. And what that means is, at the end of the day, I think Kwame said it as well, you can do all of this, but if people don't have the devices to connect, then you really don't have you know, that second step in the chain. So on a handset side, we're doing device financing, as, as Kwame already said, but we also do a number of other things to work with different resellers. As you know, MTN doesn't buy and inventory handsets. We partner with locals who are already in the business. And what this does is, in as much as we're driving handsets, we're also ensuring that local Ghanaians are participating in the value chain for supplying handsets and that will be part of our whole localization strategy. Um, but handsets is big for us. Devices, you'd see we subsidized things like Turbonet by about 60 70%, just so that people can get access. And that continues to be a deliberate strategy from us to get the indexation around devices and handsets much higher. Um, a is for affordability. Um, here, it's a bit challenging, of course, as you're an SMP, but we'll continue to work with government. Um, you know, some of our initiatives to drive affordability around pricing, but also value, again, a key strategic pillar for us. And we'll continue to work with government and everyone else to make sure these things happen and avoid situations like data zone, obviously. Um, so affordability is a big one. And again, just to mention the point that I talked about earlier, um, I get the question a lot about why can't you have things like all you can eat bundles that they do in the West? Why can't you just reduce your price on data? Um, all these other things. And again, I just want to emphasize for purposes of this, I'm sure there'll be questions, that affordability has a lot to do with your infrastructure and your cost of production. So if your cost to produce one megabyte of data is so high because you're dependent on a backbone infrastructure that's dependent on radio waves and microwaves rather than fiber, then you get to a point where you, you have no choice. Your cost of production is high, fuel prices are high to manage your sites lack of power. So you're using alternative methods just to support your uptime and your accessibility, and that increases your cost of production significantly. So these are all the things that go in that make it very difficult to do some of these things. But our objective is to reduce that as much as possible to meet our, um, the needs of our Ghanaians. The S is really service bundling. This is really where we look at things like content, what we bring on top of connectivity, but also how we give access to very interesting products and, and offers for customers to consume. So things like Pulse and, and all these things will fall into that space where we're looking at very creative ways to create offers that meet people's unique needs and ensure that they see value for what they are purchasing. The last one, which is E, is on education and, and service access. This is really saying, at the end of the day, and I think Kwame said it very nicely as well, that if all of this happens, but you're not developing people, this is why we're so passionate about the Girls in ICT program and all these other educational programs that allow us to increase literacy. I mean, we've recently committed to a $25 million investment in an ICT hub. And a large part of that, the motivation behind that in our discussions with the Honorable S. Lewis Kufu was around how do we educate the youth, especially girls, to be able to gain digital skills? And how do we support young entrepreneurs to be able to gain digital skills? So education is an important element for us. And hopefully with the examples I've given, you can see that we're not just saying it, but we're actually doing something about it as well. So I'll end here on connectivity. I'm sure there'll be questions and we can talk more about the other two verticals, digital and financial inclusion. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, Prince, for Gifek. All right. Good morning. 
um, from the GIFX standpoint, um, we were actually set up to address the digital divide. So digital divide can't really happen without GIFX being in the center of it. Um, in 2004, we were set up as GIFTEL uh, because the telephony focus was clear. You know, at that time, as you saw Kwame uh, make fun of all the old people, which actually includes me. <laughs> Although people sometimes uh, mistake me for, uh, for, for being so youthful. Um, but uh, we went through all that, making the tapes and sending them and going to Ghana Telecom office uh, to wait for a call from abroad and so on. We went through all that. Um, so Giftel was to have a telephony focus because uh, at that time, uh, access was really key, and we were trying to find every means possible to have everyone uh, have access. Uh, so uh, Giftel in 2004 came about, uh, and my predecessor, who actually came back, uh, Mr. Kofi Asante, Honorable Kofi Asante, started it uh, with the ministry uh, and, and so many chief directors I know that were involved in setting up Gif uh, Giftel. But by 2008, uh, Giftel had been changed to GIFIC uh, because uh, when uh, the Electronic Communications Act was uh, assented to uh, or came about, it was clear that we needed to have a broader mandate. Uh, and now so many people talk about meaningful connectivity, not just connectivity, but meaningful connectivity, which at GIFIC we look at as connectivity not only in terms of access, but affordability and quality as well. So we're pursuing meaning, meaningful connectivity. And again, that in many ways ties in so much with the foresight that the people that um, uh, formed GIFEC uh, were able to have even back then. Um, so GIFEC, we have three main programs, which is uh, our rural connectivity program. Uh, our cyber labs program, and then our ICT capacity building programs. So those three things in many ways uh, form the basis upon which we really tackle meaningful connectivity. Um, so we're out there uh, making sure that uh, the underserved communities, the unserved communities have uh, access. Uh, we're able to uh, connect everyone. Uh, and then from there, we look at cyber labs as the devices, as MTN was talking about, um, that when people have access, they also need the devices to be able to actually utilize the access, all right? Uh, and then finally, they need the capacity or the knowledge, the education bit, um, to be able to utilize the devices and be able to use the access that they may have. So that's what we've been pursuing. Um, we're very happy uh, and thankful that uh, our founders found it necessary right off the bat to make sure that GIFEC is set up on a collaborative, uh, in, in a collaborative fashion. Uh, so right off, the, you look at the GIFEC board, is pretty much split between industry, uh, the industry forum, and then government, almost half and half. Uh, so we very much are in the middle of uh, partnership. Uh, when we say public-private partnership, but uh, that's how we've been set up. Uh, and then collaboration is also uh, part of our vision, you know, to make sure that we collaborate with stakeholders to achieve the meaningful connectivity uh, in the unserved and underserved communities. Now, when we also talk about unserved and underserved communities, we always want people to remember it's not just spatial. Uh, it's also in terms of segmentation or segmented segments of society. So it's not just in terms of geography, uh, let's say the rural areas that don't have access, but it's also segments of our population or subpopulations who are sometimes left behind. We tackle that uh, on a regular basis as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kofi. Hi, thanks. Good morning to you all. Good morning. I think interestingly, any time we uh, think about digital divide, our mind goes all the way to the rural communities. But here in the urban area, you find that even in the urban area and within government, there's a large, and I want to talk about the government aspect of it, sure. 
that there's a huge digital divide within government, you find out that government in general do not have the needed infrastructure and connectivity that is required for this so-called digitalization that we're talking about. And so uh, what NITA we are doing right now is trying to focus on um, providing the needed infrastructure for government to make sure that a government agency, wherever you are, you have the needed infrastructure to be part of the digitalization because government sits at the core of this whole digitalization agenda. You want to receive certain services and all those sort of things. These are provided by government. And so the government agencies need this infrastructure that is required to be able to provide. And so I think we've launched what we call the e-government connectivity project, where what we are trying to do is to enable a minimum of a gigabit capacity in every district. We enable that as a government, a government a network pop. And then from there, we can do a last mile connectivity uh, within that district to that point of presence to ensure that all health facilities, all police stations, all other government agencies can be connected to this uh, uh, district pop, and then their capacity backhauled to the government service nodes, that's the data centers, which already has been built, uh, and then services can be provided for these government agencies. Of course, once you do these, uh, you provide this connectivity and all that for them, you also look at uh, the digital literacy as well. Uh, and again, within government, there is a lot to be done so far as uh, digital literacy is concerned. So there's a number of uh, uh, programs, I think some through GFX, some through Kofi Annan ICT, some through even NITA ourselves, through our partner agencies to retrain the government uh, uh, employees uh, to ensure that we equip them with the basic skills for them to use this infrastructure, to use this facility, these technologies, mm -hmm. to be able to be more efficient, to be able to provide the services as it is. So across governments, uh, that is what we're doing as NITA uh, for the time being. And I'm sure when we get into the conversation more on the issue of connectivity, uh, generally for the country, uh, I'll share my thoughts on that one as well. All right. All right, that's good. So yes, uh, indeed, uh, when we talk about digital divide, we're not only restrictive to um, the rural communities, but of course, somebody could be in Accra based on your location, based on some other dynamics, uh, income level, and so on, could be marginalized or digitally divided. Now, let's look at it from um, back to Salom. Your chase, I really like like it, uh, connectivity, handsets, um, affordability, service bundle, and of course education. So um, what specific areas uh, in terms of workforce development uh, in general that uh, you're doing in terms of uh, financial inclusion, I think you hinted on it, and um, also community building uh, and some collective action, um, you talked about the support you give for the girls in ICT and also building the ICT hub and so on. You want to dilate more on these uh, as digital, your efforts aimed at digital inclusion. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so let me expand a little bit on some of the things um, that we're doing. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a big discussion around um, our corporate social investments and, and how we focus that. Um, most of you would know that on our CSI platforms or our, CNI, our CSI initiatives, we're structured and, and, and on three specific platforms, education, health, and economic empowerment. But what we're doing today is to say, how do we align our CSI strategy towards a more digital enablement mindset, right, or at least on an initiative side. So a lot of what you would see coming out in the last couple of years, you would have seen that a lot of our CSI projects are looking at things like robotics, ICT libraries, or digital libraries. Even when we, when we go into education projects, we're looking at ways to bring an element of digitization or digital into the projects that we do. We're going to get even more indexed on that side going forward where this year we're probably going to spend you know, somewhere in the 35 to 40 million CD range on our corporate social investments. And the majority of that will start to go towards projects that have a digitalization element. So that's the first one on the CSI side. 
Secondly, when we think about our core business and, and what we do, um, today, I mean, we've achieved 99.3% population coverage for 4G. When you think of 2G and 3G, we have 99.4% population coverage. Of course, again, there are still parts of the country that are not covered, and there are still populations that are not covered. And our objective would be to get to somewhere around a 99.9 in the next couple of years. We can't do that on our own, of course, because there are other factors that drive achieving that sort of high level. And this is where some of the partnerships on rural telephony come in, working with GIFEC and government to try to do that. So this, again, for us, is a core element when we think of digital. Another element when you think of digital is what happens on top of connectivity. And you'd see that we've focused a lot on content and making sure that people have access to content. One of our flagship product, products that allows us to do that is our tool called Ayoba, which essentially today has a variety of super apps, sorry, has a variety of micro apps that have different layers of content. But a big focus on Ayoba is on local content and working with local entrepreneurs so that you know, the, the, the basic guy who's developed an app or some sort of content module has a place to place them. Now, let me just describe how this will work. So imagine in you know, two or three years' time, you have 25 million Ghanaians that have Ayoba through the MTN service. So I have an app. There is no single channel in Ghana today that can give you access to 25 million people. So you have an app, a super app, where you can place your micro app, and immediately you have access to 25 million people. It will be essentially become the largest platform to get access to the market. And that's what Ayuba is seeking to do. It's you know, similar to WeChat when you think about um, what happens in Asia, where people can aggregate content. But the second big thing is we're promoting and supporting local content, local entrepreneurs. Extremely important because today a lot of the apps we have are uh, apps that you'd receive from foreign stores, so Google Store, Apple Store, and they tend to be indexed around foreign apps. But where do our local apps go so that you can get easy access? And again, this allows a platform that can give access to, to Ghanaians for Ghanaian-consumed content. There are some advantages of all of this. Today, you know, 70 80% of our internet traffic has to go abroad and come back because there's such high demand for foreign content. This obviously means we need high international bandwidth to be able to transmit the data back and forth, or you know, expensive caching machines to reduce the latency to bring content back to customers. Now, if you can index very highly on local content, it also reduces your cost to produce content or to get content from one point to another within the country. And again, people like Main One who have international bandwidth will lose a little bit of growth, but it'll be fine. I'm sure they'll be okay. <laughs> but basically, you want to promote enough local content that your cost of bandwidth goes down. This would affect your cost of production, and it also means affordability can be managed. So I think we all need to embark on this, and I would love to see, before my good friend Leo accuses me of SMP on Ioba, to, <laughs> to, um, to also invest in a super app so that we can all go and you know, help breed these local apps and give local apps a voice and a platform to be able to push their, their, their content and products on. The fourth pillar, and I'll end on the fourth, and we can certainly go deeper, is Beyond all of this, you know, you're, you're able to get access to content, you're able to get connectivity, you have mobile, you have fixed, you have all of that. I mean, I think when we, when we start to think of the future and how people and, and where our, our systems are going, there's a lot of talk around more sophisticated services that will make us competitive. So IoT, for example, cloud-based services. Someone was talking about the partnership between um, AWS, Amazon Web Services, um, you know, to be able to train people. When you start to think about all of this, then you ask the question, I mean, what's our role and how do we prevent ourselves from being left behind, not from an individual digital divide standpoint, but from a country digital divide standpoint. When you start to think of things like AFC, FTA, and what this may mean for our competitiveness within the sub-region. So a lot of the times we may focus on competition within the country, but by disabling the competition or the path for growth within the country also means that we are creating 
a disadvantage for us as a country within the sub-region. So part of our objectives will be to make sure that we, we have all the tools and policies in place so we can continue to accelerate digitization with the view that Ghana becomes the digital hub within the West Africa sub-region as far as AFCFTA is concerned, and we can take advantage of that massive opportunity to continue to drive growth across the businesses and across our economies from a regional digitization standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly, um, you're doing a lot. Um, so let me come to you, uh, Emmanuel. Um, how do you leverage on your existing infrastructure um, for data centers and other innovative services that you intend to bring on board uh, to be able to serve some of these landlocked uh, countries? First of all, looking at Ghana. So you could speak not only as main one, but looking at the other uh, four or so cables that are terminating in Ghana. How do you guys, of course, from either the association industry forum perspective, how are we leveraging on this capacity to bring down costs? Like I said, you and I were in the business when we were selling one E1, or buying, not selling, we were buying one E1 for $21,000 for just two meg, you know, now, What's the price now? <laughs> okay. Anyway, but so please take it up. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so basically, the, the the couple of things that go into goes into the, the pricing, right? So what we're looking at is, I mean, and as a as a group, I mean, as a submarine cable operators group, I speak for all of us. Uh, what we try to do is to reduce our cost so that we can pass this on to the end user, right? So what are the cost elements? I mean, so I'll look at, I'll break it into different, three different segments. Uh, the first segment is the international portion. So the submarine aspect of it. So we were like, we came into the country around 2010 when we landed our cable, and we were just next to South Korea, as uh, Kwame um, said. Now, when we came in, what we, we, we immediately realized was that we needed to do a lot of things to ensure that we brought stability into the cable was not cable is just fine at the, at the shore, but cable can cut every every year, right? So we had a lot of collaboration with a lot of the um, agency uh, regulators in Ghana, so the GMA, the NCA, the National Security. Um, we did a lot of that uh, to a point before the other cables came in as well. What we also put in place to ensure that, of course, so every year if we had there's a cut, we are not going to spend less than six million dollars, right, to fix it. Now, once that is fixed, that goes back to uh, the cost. So to avoid that, what did we do? We put in place things like uh, AIS. AIS is uh, a way of automatically monitoring the, the shores of our country uh, up to um, about 120 kilometers. Uh, we did that. We also invested in partners in Europe who were also doing that on our behalf. Um, so that has been very helpful. Uh, so that ens ensures that we have, in fact, the first fiber cable card that we had was about 10 years after we installed a cable. So we realized that we never had that. So in 10 years after we installed the cable, we had a cut. And then a year after that, we had another cut. So we figured that there was a problem, right? So all this cost is going to go back to the end user. So we instituted a, um, a consultant to do a check to see what the problem is. And they did a lot of works and realized that um, uh, what has happened is that between 2010, and, between 2010 and 2020, the number of vessels on our shores in Ghana has increased tremendously. So we shared this, a copy of this uh, report with the NCA. We shared a copy with GMA and co. Basically, what are they trying to say? They are saying that we're having challenges in recent times because they are seeing a lot of trawlers, trawling vessels, right, fishing vessels. Um, these vessels basically are supposed to be named as Ghanaian owned, but it's, they are basically from the east. And uh, they cause, because it's trawling, when they hit the thing under the ground, they just pull it and they pull the cables. So those are the major things that we feel that um, we need to resolve. And after engaging NCA for the past two years, we've been working together to see that we don't have a repeat of the incident. So that's a submarine aspect of it. Uh, when it comes to the terrestrial aspect of it as well, um, how are we ensuring? Because our cost is basically the cost of internet plus the cost of last mile to the end user, and of course the cost of hosting it. So the cost of last mile to the end user, in recent time we've had a lot of players coming into the market, the NCA has, Licensing a lot of players who are doing Metro, who are very helpful uh, to us. 
but we've also seen that um, the cost, their cost also goes up with a lot of fiber cuts. So um, what we have been engaging, of course, with uh, the regulators is to ensure that some of these people who do road construction and things like that are trained, or at least we, we do workshops, you know, to, on our own as a, a cable of operators of Ghana, what we try to do is we have what we call awareness, a cable awareness that we try to do every year, where we bring people together and then we let them know what the challenges are. The same way, I think recently we had a letter from the LCA uh, when somebody wanted to do uh, road construction around the Nungwa area. That is something that we think is significantly improved. I mean, getting a letter from an NCA telling you that, do you have a cable there? Can you check with the guy? This is what we expect uh, to happen. And I think these are all things that are helping to uh, bring, uh, bring down the cost to the end user. Uh, the last point will be mainly in terms of the digital infrastructure bit itself. So what we realize is that uh, here to, um, if, if any operator comes in, or even the banks, as an example, when we all started, everybody had to invest into their own little bit digital infrastructure space, data centers, what they call server rooms at the time. Um, quickly, we realized that um, it is no more self-sustainable. So we, what we are doing is that we are engaging people. We are letting them know that you save about 60 percent if you, you eat in, instead of building your own thing, having your own security, having your own power systems. If you rather put your services in there, in there, of course, it has to be certified, certified commercial data center facility. And so we are working also with the Bank of Ghana uh, to also touch base with the banks so that the, instead of they having it, the Bank of Ghana insists that they have uh, a primary side and a DR side. So what we are saying is that, hey, you can put both facilities in a properly maintained data center so that you worry, you worry about just uh, how you go to market. And, uh, and in that way, you, you save uh, CapEx, you save in OPEX, and then, um, uh, of course, the end user then gets to benefit. So our aim mainly is make to ensure that the end user gets to benefit uh, in all that we do. Good. So let me come to you, Prince, um, with your 20, 2016 uh, sites that are being built. Uh, so what, what is uh, the, the timelines? I know some amount of a thousand and so had already been built and still counting. So you want to highlight in terms of uh, as part of digital inclusion program, what are the timelines in, in <laughs> getting to this 2016? And maybe some other programs that are accompanying that, that project. Um, so <clears throat> the 2016 site, I, I hear that people have been making some fun of about it here and there because we've been talking about it for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, it's been, what, a uh, little over two years now. And... Um, we're expecting to complete it, or we're expected to complete it uh, this August, uh, with the timelines having already been extended by a year. Um, but uh, the, the fact is, you know, we had COVID in there, and then we had some funding delays. In fact, one of the things that people may not know is COVID itself also had some impact on financing out there because a lot of the international organizations, the banks and so on, they were hedging uh, because uh, the economic situation and they expected, uh, of course, this is what they do for a living. They, um, uh, they do leveraging and they do uh, analysis of, of economic conditions and the environment and they knew that there were going to be challenges all over the world. So <laughs> even the funding that is supposed to come, they say, let's wait small because uh, what is going to happen? There's IMF programs coming in and all that. They knew these things well before they happened. So we've had uh, some challenges with uh, fund releases uh, and all of that have impacted the project delivery. So as it is right now, um, we uh, obviously, government is going through the debt restructuring uh, and um, the funding had uh, uh, been uh, impacted and, and so fund releases have been impacted uh, and we're hoping for that to turn around very soon so that we get going. In the meantime, the minister is not uh, waiting on anyone 
Uh, she has been working very hard. Uh, those of us who are involved, we know, looking at options uh, to get uh, funding moving in the meantime uh, so that uh, we'll be in a position to deliver uh, the project. So for now, uh, we don't have an official date uh, of any extension. Uh, the project is uh, expected to end uh, in August this year. We were supposed to complete all 2016. Uh, but realistically speaking, uh, there may be some uh, further delay in this, uh, but uh, we're, we're pushing hard. Uh, we'll wait uh, for the minister to really tell us uh, what uh, to expect next. But as I said, we're working, I know she's working on, on trying to get options uh, in the meantime to get the project moving. Gifek here and there is called upon to uh, step in, in the gap. As you know, the 2016 sites we're building is a government of Ghana project. Is the Ministry of Communications project, uh, or, you know, Ministry acting on behalf of uh, the government of Ghana, and we are implementing it yeah. or supervising the implementation. Okay, Gifek, uh, Ryan from Egego, thankfully, we've always known our role is to supervise, to project manage, to um, uh, work with industry. We've never tried to make ourselves into uh, we call ourselves an implementing agency, but that doesn't mean that we try to get into areas that are not uh, our forte. So we work, we've always worked with technical partners, private industry partners who are, you know, experienced in what they do. Uh, and we'll continue to work with them. But uh, let's wait on the minister to see uh, how we can complete. But I do know that uh, for, for, all intents and purposes, sometime between now and next year, we have to complete this project, okay? Uh, because there are many people out there who, uh, when you go to the rural areas, you know that this thing is, uh, is uh, almost life and death. Uh, it's not a joke. Uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, we've gone in, maybe we've acquired land, which is uh, the, the responsibility of GIFEC in, in the project delivery. And People are waiting for when the thing is going to go up. In other cases, we've actually put up mass, and for one bottleneck or the other, we haven't integrated and activated. And they are saying that, uh, you know, we went to one place. You should see the assembly line. The guy looks like he's always toast. And apparently, this guy, <laughs> physically, but now you saw him. <laughs> but. Uh, he's assemblyman of two areas, or at least two areas where we have sites, uh, rural telephony sites, two of these sites. And one has been done uh, and activated. So he goes to the other one and he tells them that uh, it's for some political reason, the way they voted uh, last election. So that's why they are intentionally not, we're intentionally, for that matter, GIFEC and the ministry activating their site. And this was going on for quite some time. Obviously, these sites all have to go up. We don't have a choice because people are waiting and misinformation and other things. Government is not going to put up sites that cost thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars only for show or for some kind of, I, I don't even know how sometimes people will take these things, but you'll be amazed when it comes to fake news and propaganda, the way these things work. How would you put up such a you know, significant investment only so that you won't activate it and you won't connect it or complete it for one reason or the other? It's, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. So everyone can be assured that we're doing everything we can to get all these sites activated uh, and it's just a matter of time. Uh, finally, I can say that the funding bit it has become this overarching problem that uh, we're looking at. Uh, but there had been some other bottlenecks. In some cases, it has to do with the lawyers and uh, you know, sort of commercial agreement. You know, government doing rural telephony cannot uh, do the same commercial ag uh, arrangements that they have for my, uh, my brother here, <laughs> Leo. <laughs> we can't afford those things, so we have to 
obviously negotiate uh, very hard to make sure that raw telephony uh, numbers, the financials make sense. So it's taking some time to make sure we get the necessary discounts for the people and so on. So we're trying to complete these and these have also impacted. So right now we say we have 1,008 sites built and about half of them uh, being activated and the other half not being activated. Part of the reason why many of those are not activated is for these commercial arrangements we're trying to conclude. We're very close. So as soon as those things come and then the funding bit also follow, uh, we will have, uh, you know, almost all these sites that have been built, not activated, will be activated very quickly. I expect that. Uh, and that's why we've been using the time when there's a bit of this funding issue uh, to make sure that we clear all these other bottlenecks uh, so that when the funding drops, we're just totally ready to go. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, back to Nita as government uh, provider. Looking at uh, the project, uh, digital acceleration project, and then looking at the verticals, be it health sector, agriculture, and so on. Tell us uh, some of the initiatives that from your perspective you're doing to be able to bridge the same digital divide. I think uh, uh, the connectivity I spoke about is one, of course. Then we've also realized that a lot of the digital initiatives that we've been rolling across all these years, we seem to be forgetting the local assemblies. And that is where the governance itself is emanating from. So uh, right now, our next level that we're going, we want to now try and uh, make sure when you go to a local assembly, the digitiz digitalization is, uh, so far as government side is concerned, it's like non-existence. Uh, everything that they are doing now is highly manual. Uh, some of the things that even the people who have a little bit of automation, it's in silo. I mean, uh, some is sitting here, some is sitting the whole lot of mess. So this time around, we want to focus at the assembly level. We think very well that if we're able to put the right initiatives in place, so far as the digitalization of the local assemblies are concerned, it will, it will improve their revenue generation so much. It will bring about some efficiency, some uh, effectiveness. Uh, yes, we're also a bit concerned generally about the connectivity nationwide in general, because we think if you're not careful, we might get the Koshyako, I say Koshyako approach, where we put in a lot of uh, resources, but the people that are supposed to use it do not have the means or the ability to use this effort. And comes back to connectivity again. I think maybe NCA can, uh, can help. Uh, I think the, the, the terrestrial infrastructure, there's a huge deficit still for the terrestrial infrastructure, which is causing, adding to the cost. Uh, look at the fiber uh, our, the way we are deploying fiber, for instance, uh, if you take from Accra to Kumase, MTN is on the left, uh, Vodafone is on the right, uh, another person is here. So we are duplicating these resources. And then uh, these other areas that also require the resources do not have it. Uh, I, I, we sit and then we think that the approach that probably we use for the tower uh, co-location, a similar thing probably can be looked at. I'm talking about fiber sharing, where we have maybe third parties might come in and own the fiber infrastructure. Because if I'm a third party and then I have fiber from here, from Accra to Kumasi, uh, I might not put another one in at Accra to Kumasi, but I'll look at which part of Ghana they don't have that, I think MTN will be interested, that Vodafone will be interested, and then I'll keep adding. The rate of growth for the, our fiber infrastructure, if we adopt such an approach, might accelerate, and then for us to cover more grounds than, what, than the rate at which we are doing right now. Uh, when I engage NCA, I get the, the vibe that I think they don't have fiber share regulation policy. And so it becomes a bit difficult for them how they're going to go about it. But I think if we're going to quickly get that regulation or policy in place and do the necessary engagement, we will be able to uh, accelerate the fiber deployment uh, to cover more grounds than we have now. You also have some government agencies 
that have some of these critical fiber assets. But in siloed, you take Gridco has some, Nita uh, now under Smart Infraco has some, ECG has some, all this. For me, I think that if government can consolidate this government asset and then maybe operated on behalf of government by a private institution so that you have that efficiency and things like that. Because if MTN, for instance, want to rent some of this fiber and then they have to deal with three different government institutions that they are interested in their fiber because of where they are, it is difficult to manage. But if you have one body managing it for all of them, then you know that, okay, maybe ECG has a stake this must take in it, this person, but it's operated for all of them on, be, on behalf of all of them. By, and then that one, when uh, a, a private institution is taking some capacity from them, the footprint is much larger. And so it's able, and then that one too, these government agencies, when they want to uh, also add more capacity to it, will attend to other areas that we don't have presence, but not to duplicate. And I think that this is a huge concern for those of us who are looking at the digitalization initiatives uh, when we think about connectivity. And so we think that if we can look at that aspect of it, probably, yes, we've started engagement with NCA, but I, I think the ministry too is giving us some kind of support for us to look at this. Maybe it's now time we engage the private telcos and stuff like that and see how possible we can look at this initiative. Yeah, thank you. It's now time to look at some of these initiatives. So at this juncture, I'd like to get back to the audience and maybe we can take two or three questions. Um, please restrict your questions to our discussion for today. What can we do to improve or bridge the digital divide? In other words, what are some initiatives it could also be a comment or suggestion, brief one, in terms of digital inclusion. Any two or three? I can see a hand at the back. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Collins. Uh, I'm a financial technologist, fintech person. And, uh, my question is, I mean, after all this talk and discussions and conferences, what, I mean, I'm looking forward to the day that we'll, I'll be able to sit in my room, or my room in Accra, actually, and digitally vote, right? So I, I want to, I mean, find out from MT. Oh, no, use my, and, and, and I think with all this, we can do. Because there are a lot of things that I can do with my phone here, that's supposed to be done in the US, in Accra. So I'm just looking forward to the day that we can digitize our vote, voting system. And we, if MTN can run IOMA, then I think we are ever ready. Thank you very much. I think, I think this is more of government, so I'll let Kofi Richardson rather handle that as part of the verticals. So for me, I, I think that uh, some of these issues is not just technology issue. There's technology issue, there's culture issue, there's social issue. And you know our social make of this country. So uh, if you are looking at it just as a technology issue, the te all the technologies that we can think about can be, can be, I mean, just look at our social, our social make. Anytime we want to put one intervention, that has a bit of political, you can see the divide that we have. I mean, now the biggest one that is going is using Ghana card uh, as uh, an enabler for uh, voting. You can tell how the conversation is going. So uh, yes, the technology bit can be done, but I think that the, the society must also mature and grow to a certain level for, uh, for certain acceptance uh, to happen for some of these conversations to actually happen. For me on the government side, this is what I will be able to say. Uh, I think maybe, uh, Kofi, uh, uh, Prince, you want to add something? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I think we want to build, we want to build Salem. Anyway, let's, let's have the second uh, yeah, question. Yeah, my name is Thomas Egea Samoa uh, from Helios Towers, uh, one of the a passive infrastructure providers. And of course, I'm trying to draw attention to, I mean, 
uh, Salon mentioned connectivity. One key part is access. And access, we have the active and then the passive part. And of course, if the passive goes on very well, then access becomes easier. So as an industry, or whilst we discussing communication and technology advancement and then all that, one key thing that we in the passive uh, part have seen as a major issue or a setback is the issue of maybe people's understanding of signals, the fact that it's, it has health implications and then all that. And I see one key thing that is missing there is education. And that is where possibly I want us to, as industry players, look at uh, or discuss how we can move into that space so that people have a clear understanding of radio waves and how signals are uh, transmitted. So that at least that is the best way I'm sure we'll be able to get the industry to get a foot down so that the drive and the push that we want can also be well accepted by the people, then we can all move together. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll let my colleague um, Isaac Boatin, who is the Deputy Director, Regulatory um, Administration, quickly address that. We have, we have uh, an industry working group for the EMF, electromagnetic fields um, and radiation measurements that we've done. So he would quickly just brief. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. So, just as the uh, chairman has said, NCA is very much aware of what uh, the colleague from Helios Towers talked about, about the perceived uh, health effect related, related to the sighting of marks and all that. So, just this year, the NCA ha is working on and has constituted a national, more of a national committee made up of the NCA, the Radiation Protection Institute, Ghana Health Service, also collaborated by the telcos to see how best we can demystify this kind of information. As a matter of fact, we have tools and systems at our lab that we go out there on quarterly basis to assess these kinds of emissions coming from these transmitter sites and assess per our assessment. What we have seen is that uh, there has not been any issues that is actually related. What our standard is based on the CNEP, International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radiation. So that is what we use as a benchmark to assess what, what we've been measuring. And so far, we don't have any issues that are related. These empirical evidence are actually there, and we have not been able to educate the public on that. And the reason why we have established or constituted this kind of national committee, I'm sure the plan is to have one public education on, I think, June, somewhere June, July, to be able to announce to the public, I mean, that these are what will be measured on the ground and there is the evidence and therefore we we'll use that one to educate the public. As a matter of, just as you said, we know that uh, it's an issue and as a regulator we have to actually, actually inform the public accordingly to ensure that everybody is satisfied. I also touch a little bit on the issue of the fiber the fiber DAX regulations that you, you also talked about. It's something that the NCE has also taken it up and we are working on that as well. So I'm sure in, in, in few few months you hear something about that going forward. Thank you very much, CJ. Thank you. Oh, yes. Prince. Yeah, so, um. <laughs> when we go to the rural areas, there are about uh, three main things they tend to talk about. Road is one, electricity, and then network. <laughs> and so far, the EMF issue, I think uh, some of us in Accra and, and uh, maybe abroad were very, very, uh, you know, uh, we take them, the propaganda, a bit very seriously. But uh, you ask people in the rural areas, how many of them don't want their network access uh, because they might be afraid of EMF? I think your answer is as uh, your guess is as good as mine. Thank you. Do we have another um, question? Yes, please. So that would be the last one. Hi. Yeah, my name is Fred from C Squared. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Fred from C Squared. Um, mine is more of um, a comment and a suggestion. Sure. Okay, so first off, I mean, I'd want to say. Yeah, I mean, we should all give ourselves a little bit of a pat on the back 
Um, just thinking about how much work we've done so far in terms of getting us connected. And when I'm talking about us, I mean us as a country, okay? In terms of my suggestion, um, you know, we've, if you go back in time, um, you know, like he said, um, to get the telcos to cover the country, there was an incentive, all right? If you look overall in terms of where we are at the moment, there are parts of this country where um, there's the need for more investment by way of infrastructure. I mean, specifically fiber infrastructure at the very least, okay? So perhaps can we consider alternatives, okay, in terms of our policies where investments in these areas, okay, perhaps come with some financial reliefs? I mean, I don't know. And another thing, of course, we can consider is the fact that um, wherever you, you, you want connectivity to exist, you need power to exist. Okay, so could we also look at how we could actually put these two together in terms of all the various works um, you know, that we are doing? All right, so these are the two suggestions that I have. Thank you. All right, thank you. So um, I'll give each of my panelists uh, 30 seconds uh, to make your concluding remarks, something that you want to drum home um, in terms of digital inclusion from your perspective. We'll start with Kofi and then all the way back here. I'll just take the last point that he just said. Sure. And then just end with it about power and uh, fiber. Maybe NCA should start conversation with uh, the power providers, uh, i.e. Ele electricity, netco, and then maybe all their infrastructure. I mean, we leverage on their infrastructure. It's happening some way, somehow, but probably at a national level. Uh, it also, the cost of maintaining the area fiber is much less than the underground fiber. So maybe let's have a conversation and see a leading and the telecom chambers leading that conversation uh, to now nationalize that. And then once you do that, then that means that we'll have some policy around it and some standards around it as how you will have to string your cables, as, as how you have to do this to not affect maintenance of the uh, power infrastructure as against the uh, fiber infrastructure. So I think maybe that conversation should also start so that in next 10 years or so, uh, will be more of aerial than uh, a, a underground to prevent this road construction uh, issue that we've all, we are always worried with and stuff like that. Maybe NCA should do that. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Prince. Um, from a GIFX standpoint, uh, we are a government agency and our mandate is huge. Uh, you know, where to bridge the digital divide. We're supposed to be uh, the Universal Access Fund to uh, ensure that there's universal what access uh, using all tools available to us. But as a government agency, uh, we have this huge mandate. Resources are limited, uh, and not just in terms of the financials, but also in terms of getting people to do the work they're supposed to do and to do more. Because uh, when I look at what we have to do uh, every day, it's really scary. So we're just busy trying to really push our people very hard, trying to make sure that we optimize our work, and that's what I'm focused on, so we can really tackle this thing, because people need us uh, to really deliver, and um, the resources are limited, so we just have to, so we're pushing. Thank you. All right, thank you. Salam, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Um, I just want to emphasize one of the points that Kofi made around the shared infrastructure model. I'm a big fan of it, and MTN is a big fan of it as well. As part of our Ambition 2025 strategy, we have five main pillars, and one of them is network as a service, which is promoting shared infrastructure. Um, the importance of this you know, cannot be overemphasized. It's, I mean, it's so important for us as a country because that's the only way we're going to accelerate having the basic infrastructure in an efficient manner. I mean, we'll spend a lot of money to get there, but bringing it all together means you can do it faster, you can do it cheaper, and we can be competitive as a country. So I just want to reinforce that this is a very important point that we should probably have a big initiative around shared infrastructure model um, to put Ghana in a competitive place in the region. Thank you. All right, thank you. Emmanuel? Uh, thank you, Isa. So I would like to talk about collaboration. I would like to end on collaboration. I think uh, 
I mean, two of us, private sector, two public sector. I think we need to do more in collaborating and even in policy, influencing policy. And I speak as on behalf of my um, cable operators group, also on behalf of ISPs, both of which I'm, I'm board members of. And uh, we need to work more with uh, the, the regulators in kind of which we have been doing. And I think that uh, we need to influence policy to the point where it benefits the end user, which is the main reason for us all being in business. So that's what I went. Thank you. On that note, I'd like to thank uh, my panelists and also, of course, the audience uh, for listening and contributing. Shall we give them a round of applause? And thank you. Thank you so much. So I hand over to the moderate, uh, the MC. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. So we've come to the... Um, uh, Prof, you actually have uh, another role to play to give us the closer remarks. Uh, I don't know whether that's, it's, it's all captured where you are. A okay. few remarks from you. All right. Um, good afternoon. I, I want to believe that it's been a very fruitful day. Uh, we started on a good note with high expectation, and I can say that we've not been disappointed with, the, with the, a very interesting presentation from the guy I call Ambassador, Ambassador at the Telecom uh, Front, Kwame, and then also with the panel discussion, a lot of insights. I was at a point tempted to think maybe I was still in the classroom, so when Salom gave the chase, I wanted to look for somebody and said, can you uh, give me the full meaning of the CHASE acronym? Then I realized that, look, you're sitting here as a regulator. <laughs> but that said, we've had uh, um, a lot of educative, insightful sessions. And I'd like to say once again, on behalf of uh, my boss, the Director General, and on behalf of the management, we want to say a big thank you and for your participation. We wish you best of the day and in the coming weeks and months, the rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Prof. Uh, so, part lunch will be served at the, will be given to you at the, at, at, at the foyer. Media, you have your place for your lunch. The rest of the guests as well will go to the adjacent room to the main auditorium here for our lunch. Again, thanks so much for being part of this year's celebrations. It's been an honor coming your way. Once again, my name is Kwame Jan, and thank you once again. <laughs>